Hey guys, welcome back to the channel. My name is Maggie and I was a professional MCAT tutor before I decided to switch over to Medfluencer. My brother and I run this channel and this company to help pre-meds like you ace their MCAT without having to spend like a million bucks. So today we're going to be going over the new AAMC uh, free practice exam, passage five of the psych -Soch section. As y'all know, psych -Soch is close to my heart. I actually, I actually haven't, haven't looked, looked at, at this passage, passage at all. At all. Um, I, I just, just hit, hit play. play. As I go through this passage, I'm going to be flow charting over here on the right. If you're not sure what that means, that means you haven't watched enough of mine and John's videos. Flow charting is what is going to really help you understand the passages that you're reading and keep all these things straight in your brain as you're like literally learning about something new while you're taking the test, um, which is like a really fun and flirty thing that the MCAT does. But it's going to help you with active reading. It's going to help you uh, stay in the passage and not be like reading a line of text while you're like thinking in your head like, oh my God, I don't know what any of this means. It's going to help you uh, keep track of like acronyms and stuff. I know that was a big thing when I started. Like I was like, I can't keep track of what all these acronyms are and I'm tired of having to look back in the passage. going to help you keep track of relationships. Honestly, flow charting is the best and you should definitely go watch um, the video on it. I think it's called like make every MCAT passage easy or something like that. Without further ado, let's get into this. So it starts out Alzheimer's disease is the most common form of dementia. Loss of sensory motor skills also occurs in patients with Alzheimer's, but not until a later stage of the disease. So if this is something that you didn't originally know, it maybe want to be something that you just quickly put on your flow chart. And specifically, what am I talking about? Just that Alzheimer's is a type of dementia and that sensory motor deficits come later. That's kind of what I was talking about. It says in study one, researchers used magnetoencephalography to map the cortical response of a thumb twitch that was evoked by electrical stimulation of the median nerve in the arm. Participants were patients with Alzheimer's and controls without Alzheimer's. So this is immediately getting into the research methods. They're going to use this meg to look at how your thumb twitches when you electrically stimulate the median nerve in the arm. I'm not going to write that down. That's it's it's pretty concise right there. And no, I don't know what this is. The results showed that for Alzheimer's patients, there was a spatial shift in cortical activity that was independent of latency or strength of the electrical current compared to controls. The cortical shift was located at a posterior region of the somatosensory cortex and was determined not to be the result of brain atrophy known to occur in Alzheimer's. So Alzheimer's patients had a spatial shift in the somatosensory cortex. That's the main thing that I got out of that paragraph, that there was a difference um, in the results. In study two, researchers used magnetic resonance imaging, MRI, to determine whether pharmacological agents showed brain atrophy, slowed brain atrophy in Alzheimer's patients. Uh, participants were individuals diagnosed with mild to moderate Alzheimer's and healthy controls. Participants with Alzheimer's were on the daily drug treatments of an acetylcholine esterase inhibitor, donepazil, which is used for mild to moderate Alzheimer's, or a combination therapy of an acetylcholine esterase inhibitor and the ND NMDA, NMDA antagonist memantine, used for moderate to severe Alzheimer's. So we're given some, some groups here, right? And I want to make sure that I keep those straight. So they were either given an acetylcholine esterase inhibitor or an acetylcholine esterase inhibitor plus, you know, NMDA antagonist. The effects of pharmacological treatment on brain atrophy, cognitive scores, and daily living scores in Alzheimer's patients were compared to control participants. So that is our, like, outcomes that we're looking at. The cognitive score was determined by word recall, word recognition, comprehension of spoken language, and word naming tasks. The daily living score was determined by the ability to do routine tasks such as grooming, eating, and walking independently. So that's just telling us like the operational definitions. I hope you all know I just spent like five minutes trying to look up that word, operational definition. Because I couldn't remember it, but I like that word. So they're just defining how they are measuring those kinds of things. Then we get the results, and so let's interpret some figures here. Start with the uh, figure caption. Effects of drug treatment in Alzheimer's patients compared to controls on brain atrophy in A, cognitive score in B, and daily living scores in C. And the star indicates a significant difference. So we see that those given just the acetylcholine esterase inhibitor have a significantly, oh, significantly more brain atrophy. That's not good. So for this one, I'm going to say acetylcholine esterase inhibitor, bad. I love using like smiley faces and frowny faces. So in the cognitive score, it looks like the combination therapy won out. 
So combo equals good because we had a high cognitive score. And then the daily activity score. Interestingly enough, um, the control actually had the best score, um, but it was only significantly different from the combo therapy. So I'll just say combo was bad for daily living. So kind of like weird results, right? I think this is like a, actually a really good figure to look at if you're ever confused about like significance um, in figures and how they like display that. So like drawing these little brackets right here between these two bars indicates a significant difference from this group to this group. Um, also, you have this one over here that indicates a significant difference between these two groups. But it looks like there's no bar if if the control was significantly different from the combo, then there would be another one that looked like this, um, like another bar that drew from, from this one to this one. But since that's not there, they were obviously not significantly different. So the acetylcholine esterase inhibitor group was the only one that was significantly different, and it was different from other groups. Now, since they gave us like that they're going to put a little star by it if it's significant, we don't really have to use the error bars. But if you'll see like between these two groups, the error bars overlap. So like the top of this one kind of lands in the middle of this one. And that's how you know that these two are not significantly different from one another. The fact that these are significantly different is different is indicated one by the star, of course, but also by the fact that the error bars don't overlap at all. So that's just a little food for thought. So what did we get from this passage? We got an interesting result in study one with um, like thumb twitching that we saw a spatial shift in the somatosensory cortex. And then we also saw some interesting results of pharmacological interventions for Alzheimer's patients on three different kind of outcomes. So going straight into the questions, question number 23 says, in study two, the primary function of donepazil is to... So donepazil, if you'll remember, was that acetylcholine esterase inhibitor. So just glancing down at the answer choices, I was I was thinking it was going to ask about like how it fit into um, the study design, but it's not really asking about that. It's literally just asking about like what would an acetylcholine esterase inhibitor do. So you have acetylcholine, you have acetylcholine esterase, and then you have acetylcholine esterase inhibitors. And this is something that like still kind of like trips me up sometimes. Acetylcholine esterase is the enzyme that degrades acetylcholine. And so if I have an acetylcholine esterase inhibitor, then I'm actually going to be functionally increasing acetylcholine. Or really, I'm just not getting rid of it as fast, but functionally the same thing. Is that represented by A, increase the antagonistic effects of acetylcholine? No, right? You can talk about antagonistic effects of acetylcholine like with certain like specific receptors. That's not at all what we're getting at here. We're just getting at acetylcholine esterase inhibitors like donepazil are going to in functionally increase um, acetylcholine. They're kind of like an agonist in that way. B, increase the duration of acetylcholine action. Absolutely, right? Because when you think about like um, a nerve synapse or a neuromuscular junction, what happens is that acetylcholine kind of gets released into that neuromuscular junction. And then um, usually there's an option for like neurotransmitters or th something to get like reuptaken. Um, I'm pretty sure if I remember correctly from my psych class as an undergrad that acetylcholine actually doesn't have that option. The only option is for it to get degraded. And so if I cut out the degrading part, then I am like not letting acetylcholine leave the synapse. I, it's going to stay within the synapse and continue to bind to the receptors on the neuromuscular junction and exert effects. So I am increasing the duration of acetylcholine action for sure. Am I inhibiting the release of acetylcholine? No, absolutely not, right? It's not an acetylcholine inhibitor. It's an acetylcholine esterase inhibitor. It inhibits the enzyme that breaks it down. Am I inhibiting the formation of acetylcholine? No. Number 24 says, which conclusion cannot be made based on the design of study two? So what was the design of study two? So they basically gave them drugs and then looked at these different things. And we were told like operationally how they define these things. Brain atrophy was done by MRI. Cognitive score was done by the these tasks. And then the daily activity scores was done by like, can they groom themselves and stuff? But what conclusion cannot be based made based on the design? The benefits of pharmacological mono and combination therapy show differential effects. And I, I usually like to think about what I want the answer choice to say before I get into it, but I kind of like don't really know what they're going for. So I'm just going to read the answer choices. 
A says denepazil provides better results than memantine. So we never actually tested memantine specifically. We tested memantine, which was the NMDA antagonist, in combination with an acetylcholine esterase inhibitor, but in no way, shape, or form did we only use memantine. So we can't really, um, you know, kind of pit these two against each other. So I like that answer because I don't feel like we can make that conclusion. B says combination therapy with memantine does not always provide better results. That was true, right? We saw that in um, this right here. That's why I like like quickly doing the results of the study so that I don't have to like spend time going back through these. So that's a true statement. So it's wrong for this cannot question. C, monotherapy does not always provide better results. That is true. We saw that uh, right here and right here. Monotherapy would just be the acetylcholine esterase inhibitor alone. And we saw that it had a detrimental effect here, right? Because there was more brain atrophy. And we saw that it just like just didn't perform quite as well in the cognitive score. It was actually better in the daily activity score, but that's this question is that is like an all or nothing. So monotherapy does not always provide better results. That is true. D, the results depend on the type of neurobiological test. Absolutely right. We definitely saw different results with these different drugs depending on the neurobiological test that we used. So A is going to be our best answer here. 25 says, which statement is supported by the results of study two participants treated with? So let's just go through these and uh, kind of like the last one, just see if they're true. Acetylcholine esterase inhibitors showed significantly better protection from brain atrophy compared to those treated with combination therapy. No, right? There was actually like way more brain atrophy with those who were taking acetylcholine esterase inhibitor. So that's not right. Combination therapy showed significantly better cognitive ability compared to those in the acetylcholine esterase inhibitor group. So we're looking at cognitive ability between combination and acetylcholine esterase inhibitor. So look, I, I kind of talked about this earlier, but there's no significant bar between like these two. It would look like that if there was a significant difference between the combo and the acetylcholine esterase inhibitor group. So since that bar is not there, there is not a significant difference. That's why you always want to pay attention to those markers of significance, like little asterisks. C says combination therapy showed significant behavioral impairment compared to participants in the control group. So I guess they're talking about like behavioral impairment. I, I guess they're talking about this daily activity score. And there was a significant difference. Like there was a significant detriment actually with the combo therapy in in uh, comparison with the control. So that is actually true. So I'll put a little maybe sign by it. Acetylcholine esterase inhibitor group showed significant cognitive and behavioral improvement compared to those in the combo group. So now we're looking at cognitive and behavioral. So that would be those last two graphs. And we're saying that the acetylcholine esterase inhibitor was better than the combo. No, right? There actually like wasn't even a significant difference here and there wasn't a significant difference here. So either way, there wasn't a difference between those two. So C is going to be our correct answer here. Key word in all these was significant. So just make sure that whatever you say is significantly different, that there is actual like statistical significance to back that up. Number 26 says the results of study one and or study two suggest that patients with Alzheimer's show a, a significant structural loss of brain cells that can be prevented by pharmacological treatment. So, okay, this is a dangerous answer choice because you want to say yes, because you know that Alzheimer's does cause brain atrophy and you know that like they're leaning into this right here where we can you know, see less brain atrophy if we use this combo treatment. But if you'll remember up here, it said that these results that they saw in study one was determined not to be a result of brain atrophy known to occur in Alzheimer's. And I wouldn't even, I wouldn't even say that th they're talking about brain atrophy here. They're talking about a shift in cortical activity, which is like just where the brain kind of lights up when you're using it. So the study one was not talking about brain atrophy and then study two did kind of talk about brain atrophy, but I don't know. I'll, I'll put a maybe by it. I'm not totally in love, but it's all right, I guess. Study two did kind of lean into that a little bit. B says structural loss due to atrophy, but reorganization may preserve, preserve functional activity in some brain regions. 
So that actually that's kind of giving like what I was trying to say earlier, that it was a shift in study one in the cortical activity is not necessarily brain atrophy. They said that they know brain atrophy occurs in Alzheimer's, but that that's not like what they found. They found a, a shift in cortical activity. So that was, that's interesting. I'll put a maybe beside it. C says a functional loss in memory and structural loss due to atrophy that can be re- reversed through pharmacological treatment. So reverse, to say that we could reverse something, you would have to have like really intense data. And we just don't have that. There's no group that like got really bad and had brain atrophy and then we were able to reverse it and bring them back. D says functional loss in motor skills required for daily living without significant structural loss due to atrophy. So I think we saw like a structural loss due to atrophy in like at least in study two, right? So like I don't feel like it's fair to say that there was not a significant structural loss due to atrophy. And it said in study one at the end of that paragraph that they know that brain atrophy occurs in Alzheimer's. So I don't think that D is right. So between A and B, I would say that looking at the study, because if we're talking about actual brain atrophy, then we're probably talking about study two. And if we're looking, there was still like significant amount of brain atrophy. I mean, we're still at sitting at a 15% or whatever, just because they weren't significantly different from the controls. It's just a lot to say that brain atrophy can be prevented by using any of the pharmacological treatments that they used because we didn't prevent it, clearly. It still happened. But we did see that there was reorganization in light of the atrophy. So B is a better answer there. Okay, I hope you guys liked that walkthrough. Let us know in the comments down below what you want to see next or uh, what you absolutely hated that I did or that you liked that I did. But most importantly, hit like and subscribe if you want to see more MCAT content or other type of content. We do other type of content. I don't know if y'all saw John's uh, coffee video. I thought it was like so fun. I've watched it like twice already. And we've got some other stuff in the works for you guys too. So make sure to stay tuned and I will see you guys in the next video.